Hey, everybody, this is Two EdTech Guys Take Questions and Share Cool Stuff. And we come to you almost every week. Uh, we weren't here last week. Uh, apologies, had a few things going on. Um, but uh, glad to be back. And it is good fun to be able to spend some time with you guys. So thank you very much for joining us today. Ha, don't need that. Um, this is our 25th show, Richard, 25. How cool wow. is that? Fun, yeah? Yeah. All good there. And we are happy that you would take the time to spend a little time with us as, as we do this. We want to send out some special thanks to all the good folks at the Krauss Center for Innovation at Foothill College in San, uh, not San, Los Altos Hills, California, uh, and the Merit 20 crowd, yeah. And also to the good folks from Long Island University and their, and their ed tech master's program. So we've got, we've got people from LIU who are, are going to going to take this in as well. So thanks to them. And then, of course, Free Tech for Teachers. Been around a few years, I believe, Richard. 13 years this month. Yeah, happy birthday to Free Tech for Teachers, a, a 13. Nextvista.org uh, is my little attempt to save the universe from ignorance. One create a video at a time. Loads of good videos about uh, educational stuff and communities around the world and service to others, all kinds of things. And we do webinars, as you can tell, because we're doing one right now. And <laughs> later today, we'll do activities across grade levels, celebrating holidays. So while that's a christmas e kind of thing going on there, we're going to be talking about it more broadly than that. But if you're thinking about like, how, how, do I, how do I work effectively, you know, we're, we're talking to kids about holidays. We're, we're, going to be, we're going to be looking at some ideas, me and Susan Stewart. She is a, an amazingly cool person, and we hope you will join us for that at 3.30 Pacific 6.30 Eastern today. Uh, I would I would say what time that is in Luxembourg, but I'm not entirely sure. I'm guessing it's 12.30 at night, maybe something like that. All right, anyway, how this is going to work today, what we're going to do is we're going to start taking questions pretty quick here because we got like a mile long list of them. And we're going to we're going to try to keep our answers short, but we don't have much of a history of that. So you're just going <laughs> to have to see how it goes. All right. So with that, Richard, you the man. Start us off. All right. So our, our first question uh, came from Mary, who says, I'm wondering if either of you have an upcoming webinar or workshop in how to create online games step by step. I know a couple weeks back, Richard had posted how to create them. Yep. Thank you for your time. I don't have a webinar specifically about that plan. However, in my YouTube channel, I have a whole bunch of tutorials on making different types of games, uh, including a lot of, uh, I'm a big fan of Flippity. So I do a lot of Flippity type of, uh, type of activities. Flippity.net, great place for all kinds of games. Um, and someone else had asked about games this week in, in, a, in a similar but slightly different question. Um, and it depends on how complex you want it. So I'm going to kill two, two birds with one stone here. Uh, Flippity.net is great for simple games. Right? You want to do matching games, memory games, that sort of thing. Great for that. If you want to do something a little bit more in depth than those matching type of games, you might want to get into like classtools.net has some good templates. But then beyond that, start thinking about some of the programming tools that are available to you, like um, the MIT App Inventor, right? The MIT App Inventor is a great tool for making your own Android applications. Now, it takes a little bit more time, right? There's a lot, a lot more learning curve, right? There's a lot more learning curve to the MIT App Inventor or to any of the tools that code.org offers, but you can create a much more in-depth, much more robust game using something like that. Uh, however, the learning curve on that is like this, whereas like Flippity is like this. Fair enough. You can also look up for, uh, you know, kind of the standard stuff related to quit, uh, like Kahoot-ish right. things, although I'm a big fan of quizzes uh, as an alternative. Uh, they, they, are, they are a really strong option on that front as well. Um, because we have like uh, several thousand questions though, I'll, I'll restrict my comments and we'll move on. All right, so the, the other game-related question came from Kimberly. Uh, I'm teaching New Mexico history. Hey, shout out to New Mexico. Uh, 
My students will be starting a large assignment that requires a presentation, a project, and an activity that the class does. Kids can do practically anything. I'm making a sheet of ideas and links. Many of them have gotten, many I've gotten from you. Uh, if the student wanted to create a role-playing game for his or her classmate, what program would be used? Uh, and Rustin, you suggested Classcraft as an yeah. option. Yes, yes, yes. Classcraft is, 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 a, is a very interesting site, right? Um, it, it's, it's really all about how to, to gamify learning. So it's kind of this cross between, you know, cool behavioral stuff and trying to get people connected to, uh, to different things with regard to the content that gets taught and how do they work together in teams. And happily for you, we actually had uh, none other than Cass Pereira, the teacher in residence at the Krauss Center for Innovation on activities across grade levels. So, so I'm on the activities across grade levels page right now. And if I start scrolling down, the very first one there is gamified learning, right? And that one, that's, that's a 30 minute episode we did on games for little kids and games for upper elementary. And then we, we, get, we went uh, diving deep on uh, Classcraft with Cass, which was pretty cool. I will get that in the chat so that you can grab that as well. Um, there is how to get to the webinar pieces, but, uh, but very cool stuff. You know, she, she, was, she had so many cool things to say about, about how, how it really encouraged a lot of teamwork from uh, from the different the different kids on on helping each other get things done because there were there were kind of group point value this and that uh, so so that 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 worked out pretty well cool and uh, a question that was just popped into the chat so let's we'll, we'll just do the ones in the chat right now uh, mm -hmm. Leora asked how can I avoid distance cheating of students for assessment so. This is one we we get this one. I'd say every third week we get this question, Rustin. And, and it's a good stuff. question. It, it is a good. Question. It is a good it is. one. So and I'll, go I'll for jump it. in. I'll jump in. So essentially, it comes down not to some kind of technical solution to to get in the way of their bad impulses. It comes down to the nature of the of the assignments and the assessments you do. So if what you ask are, are simple factual things. How tall is Mount Everest? All right, people can find it any different way. And, and, and if they are looking it up online and coming up with the answer, that arguably is not cheating. How, however, the point being that, that what you want are to ask questions that, that are going to be very specific to what the student is learning. How does this compare to another thing that we have uh, worked with in class? You know, you know, draw a contrast with, with this and this. Explain a creative connection between this and this and this. The kind of stuff that's not google bowl. And, and if, if that's what you do, you end up with far more interesting answers from them. It will take a little practice if they're used to very low level fact recall kind of things. Um, however, uh, everybody's life will get better going forward if, if you can if you can think along those lines for sure uh, and and work with a colleague or two and in, in how you approach that because in doing that uh, you don't feel like you're you're out kind of exploring completely on your own which can be a bit of a nervous place to be yeah and i would say the last little thing i'd, I'd tag on to that is you know i'm doing this with my own students doing more of a performance based type of ass assessment Mm -hmm. Again, like Russian said, you know, applying, applying, this, applying the knowledge, applying the skill, you know, I, I've done lately a lot with my, with my, uh, my year two and three students in computer science, you know, a lot of, okay, you have to go to a brand new facility and set up a brand new network, you know, what are the first five steps you're going to do and why are you going to do them in that order, right? that, that sort of question, which, you, which takes a heck of a lot more time to review and grade than doing, you know, a Google form with 15 multiple choice tests questions on it. Exactly, exactly, exactly. All right, let's do one more and then we'll get to cool shares. All right, uh, question from Larry. I hope this finds you well. Uh, if you are going to, uh, regarding podcasts, if you are going to post them to a place your class could access to listen to, what, what site or location would you use? I'm a big fan of anchor.fm and I like anchor because while you can record directly on anchor.fm's website, if you record with another tool, Audacity, SoundCloud, whatever, uh, and then upload it, Anchor gives you a page for all of your episodes. And so you can just go 
and direct people to that one page. It's a simple website that has all the all the episodes you ever upload. And Anchor distrib- does all the hard work of distributing to Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, all those platforms so people can find your podcast. Uh, whereas if you try to self-host it and do the manual RSS feed configuration or whatnot, it's a lot harder for people to find it. So anchor.fm is the way to go. If you want to see a sample of this, my dog has a podcast page. Uh, it's called the Mason Barks Podcast. And you can go and look at it just to get a sense of, oh, there it is. Ruxin's already beaten to it. Yeah, there it is. I, I see that. I see that the most recent uh, posting was July of 2019. Well, yeah, you know, uh, he he only did ten episodes. <laughs> ten. That's awesome. All mm-hmm. right, uh, no, nothing nothing really to add other than if if you are looking for more ability to edit uh, an audio file, you might take a look at Soundtrap. Uh, Soundtrap.com is is a is a great site. Or uh, for doing a lot of collaborative audio work, if you're having them do interviews with each other or anything like that, I mean that's pretty cool. But uh, but it, it's kind of like GarageBand online, um, and and it, it's even got that look to it, which is which is kind of nice as well. All right, in, in the spirit of, of moving quickly, based on our having you know like uh, several football fields uh, length worth of questions in, in th- this week, Richard. Oh, let me do that and. Ta-da! Richard, talk to us. All right. So it's uh, going to be Thanksgiving here in the United States in a few weeks. My favorite holiday. Oh, what a, arguably my favorite holiday. Definitely my favorite holiday in November. Uh, and so Esri has a cool story map called Mapping the Thanksgiving Harvest. And what it is, it's an interactive map of where does your food come from? Or where do our traditional Thanksgiving foods come from? And it's a nice little interactive story map. You can scroll through and, and see, uh, you know, this interactive map of what, where to tur- you know, where do we grow turkeys and you know other, other neat stuff about Thanksgiving. Okay. So there's that. You know, where do cranberries grow? You know, most of them are grown in New England, right? Uh, you know, sweet potatoes, potatoes, hot potatoes in Maine, green beans, very few green beans in Maine, right? Brussels sprouts. Interestingly, Brussels sprouts, not grown nearly as uh, many places as I, as I would have thought. But anyway, uh, pumpkins are all over the place. So that's a cool little thing. But on the next slide, Rushton, on the next slide, I have included a video about how to make an interactive story map of your own using a different tool, not using Esri. You could use Esri. Uh, but this uses the uh, Night Lab at Northwestern University has a tool called Story Map JS, and I'll put the link in there. Actually, the link is in there, I believe, in the in the slides. Uh, Story Map JS is a great little tool for making an interactive map, uh, inter- interactive story map. It's a little bit different than than our uh, typical like Google Map. Yeah, I'll put it in like that. Is this, Typical. is this what you were talking about here? Yeah, yeah, I just put the link in the chat too. Good, good, good. Link in the chat, yeah. Uh, so they have a whole bunch of different templates. One of them is called the story map template. And rather than doing your Google map of just some inter- of some place markers or your Google Earth of just place markers, this is actually more of a story that you scroll through and it's geolocated. So it's a neat tool. Neat tool. Very cool indeed. All right. Let's keep going. What do we got in terms of uh, questions? All right. Um, let's see. Oh, where was I? Um, so thanks for your emails. Uh, I'm looking to be able to zoom with a whiteboard that scrolls. I see it being done in this YouTube video, and there's a little link to the video. The professor explaining how to solve a confidence interval problem scrolls his whiteboard up to be able to continue with the solution further down. Any idea which whiteboard he is using? Well, I looked at the video and my hunch is that he's probably using a tool like Explain Everything or is just using a big white uh, document, whether a Google document or a Word document and has cropped out the borders of it so you don't see those borders in in those scrolling tools. 
which is exactly what I do sometimes uh, when I'm working with a, you know, in, the, in Zoom, I use Zoom for my hybrid classes. Uh, sometimes I'll do that, just a big Google document and I don't, and I just have blown up so you don't see the borders and I'm just scribbling on top of it. So you can do that too. It's pretty cool. Say it's, it's one of those don't overthink it, you might outsmart yourself type of thing. <laughs> the, I, I took a look at that, the, the part of the video that he mentioned as well. And uh, I, wild guess is that it's something like notability on an iPad, maybe. I mean, that, that's, that's a good tool for that kind of thing. So uh, I'll, I'll toss in that as a guess as well. Richard, keep us going. All right, question from Pam. Would you know if there is a company that schools can rent computer for, computers from? I'm in New Jersey, if that helps in any way. Thank you for any information you can provide, Pam. Uh, so I don't know about renting per se, other than like your typical rent -a center, color centers, uh, you know, that, that charge you like 97% interest uh, to, you know, on a rent to own pro program. Uh, I don't think it's that high, but it's pretty, pretty darn high. Uh, other than those, I don't know of like rental programs. I do know that there are companies that do lease programs. And I know this uh, because I've worked with my Dell, my, local-ish Dell rep in the past talking about, uh, you know, there are le lease programs. I believe CDW also does a lease program. That's a more long-term, usually it's a, a two to four year cycle of leasing equipment, as opposed to what I think Pam is looking for is more short-term rental type of things. Uh, but Rustin, you had a good, you had a good little idea. You had a good idea that I didn't, I didn't think of. So you know, a lot comes down to exactly what it is you're looking to do with rented computers. Um, and in thinking about the idea that uh, you've got, say, this segment of students who need computers, uh, one of the things that I have seen in a number of places uh, around the country uh, and that we, we used to do kind of out here as well uh, is run these kind of CTE, career technical ed programs, where, where the students learn to refurbish computer stuff. So, so they learn a lot of hardware. Uh, they, they're able to get in, take them apart, put them back together. That that kind of active learning is really good for a lot of kids. No. Yes. And uh, and and in doing that, uh, they they also learn, for example, that they can make these things valuable to others. So so there are companies, for example, that would love to be able to do some kind of write off. Uh, you know, taking older equipment, and for them, older may not be that old, right? They they need the latest and greatest. And to be able to take that kind of stuff and to move it around to school so that they can do it as long as there's some assurance that the data on the drives is getting wiped off or blah, 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 you know, that kind of thing, uh, then, then that works out pretty well. But what you can do is if the kids learn to refurbish computers so that it's kind of good to go, those computers could go to students who need them or to, say, the elderly in your community. So, you know, especially now with the, uh, with, with the issues that we have with the pandemic, there are a lot of uh, a lot of elderly who need kind of simplified computers. You know, Chromebooks are great for this kind of thing. Um, where where what they do is they're able to just connect with their families. Uh, so a number of different possibilities. We've got a kid in my Creative Solutions for the Global Good class working on this very idea right now. Uh, spent mm -hmm. for for the the Senior Citizen Center that that he volunteers time at. And so some some cool things that that are going on with students there. I wish I'd thought of that because as you know, I teach a CTE program on computer repair. You do? I don't know why I didn't think of gathering them, refurbishing them and passing them out to other kids. I, I uh, let, let it be something that becomes a part of your near future. <laughs> because, because right this week we are doing remote installs of software. Uh, that's actually what we're what my kids were learning this week. So uh, you know, I, I don't know why I didn't think of that myself. But anyway, there we go. Uh, all right. So uh, next question came from Sharon. Uh, I can't seem to find a solution to a problem I have with Zoom. What is a simplified way to organize and place Google slide presentations in a chronological order for showing on Zoom? I'm an intervention specialist with six 30 minute sessions on Zoom with different grade group students with reading or math issues, I have a few Google slides made up for each 30 minute block. What's the best way to line them up and show a set of slides? So what I suggested and what I actually do myself sometimes is 
I'll just, if I know I'm going to have like bang, 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 you know, three classes in a row with only five minute breaks in between them or, or you know, and I, I've actually done, and I've done this when I've been a virtual presenter at conferences and you only have like a five minute break between each session. I just put, I just write out my schedule in a Google document, put the links to my Google slides into my schedule and boom, 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 boom. I have them all lined up there. That's how, that's what I do. I, I had a, I had essentially the same suggestion. Um, you know, you could always, of course, combine all of these decks into one deck. All right, fine. Um, but, but this, for example, from a few, couple of weeks ago, uh, three weeks ago, maybe we we did, you know, like our, our usual weekly thing. And this this is what a links document looks like when when you follow the the note in the email that I send everybody who registers for for this. And, and you can get to all of these things that we talk about, or at least all the ones that we managed to get the links in for. Uh, and in doing that, you know, you're just you're just putting a title in and then highlighting that title, doing all the normal stuff, going to the link, you know, and then adding what you're going to what you're going to add. And that can be kind of a nice, clean way of doing it. And that becomes easy to come back to and use later as well. Uh, so so some pretty good options on that front, I'd say um, I would I would say this if it is. And I think this actually addresses maybe another question somewhere as well. If you are concerned about what it means to to like, let's say you're in Zoom you're sharing your screen and, and you want to share a different screen. So you stop sharing and then you share a new screen. If you do that that way and you've arranged, say, the, the set of, uh, of video feeds from your students in a way that you like it and it annoys you because that stops it and you have to redo it, don't stop sharing. Instead, go back and instead of, instead of stop and start, go to new share and then you can just share a new screen which allows you to keep things set up in Zoom the way you want, which is which is often something that I think is good for people to know. I will say, if you do that, Rustin, yes, uh, be aware of how resource intensive that can get to be on your system. Ah. Uh, if you don't have a whole lot of RAM available, that can become a real drag on your system by the time you get to like your third hour of doing that. Mm -hmm. And I know that from having done that just yesterday myself, uh, try, trying to do that. I did a three hour webinar for a group yesterday. Uh, and yeah, it, 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 too many things running at once, too many things queued up at once. It, it gets, uh, gets a bit resource intensive. But Russian, you've got a quick, a cool quick share. So I, I do. I have a very, a very cool quick share. Um, so in, in, my little Rotary Club is the Rotary E Club of Silicon Valley. All right, so it's a little service group. Uh, we're, we're an online club. We are asynchronous because, of course, some, somebody like me, who's primarily an educator, meeting somewhere on, say, Thursdays at noon for lunch is, you know, even in the non-pandemic times, is not really in the cards. Uh, so, so it's kind of cool to have a Rotary Club where, or, or any service club, where you can just log in anytime during the week and take in the meeting. So we, we had a presentation this week from a woman, uh, interestingly, her last name is Bakewell, let that sink in, from an organization called Cake for Kids, all right? And uh, what they do is, is they work with people uh, who are, are willing to bake cakes and personalize them, right? And, and then what the organization does is they get these cakes to, to foster kids, often who have never had their own birthday cake. And so, oh, this is, it was a beautiful story, right? And I just thought that's just so awesome. I got to share it. So cake for kids, number four, cake for kids.org. Totally cool folks. And, uh, and so if you're looking for something that just, just kind of makes you, makes you smile, take a good look. And they, they've got uh, somewhere in there, they, I think they got a gallery that is somewhere. Yeah, you can find it. Um, but, but anyway, they, 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 they've got all of these cool pictures, you know, it's actually somewhere in there. I don't know, but, but wonderfully cool stuff. And, and uh, I think there were several of us in the group that were like, whoop, I'm going to need some Kleenex, you know, cause, cause it was, it was beautiful. It was a really beautiful story. So y'all know cake for kids.org. Very cool. Let's see if Great. we can get to another question, maybe two. All right, let's see. Uh, so a question that came into the live chat from Joan, mm -hmm. any suggestions for a to-do list for my Google Classroom assignments? I'm trying to cut the time I spend making the to-do list, to list for each period and posting them. 
Um, so Joan, are you saying like, in addition to that little summary tool that, that Google Classroom provides, in Google Classroom itself, like if I go to my Google Classroom right now uh, and I'm looking at all the things I have or haven't done as the case may be, um, on the left-hand side, I've got my little to review button, uh, kind of a, where just above where all my classes are listed. So you know that in, in addition to that, like my to review shows that right now I have uh, six app design projects that I need to grade and it has uh, two lab configuration, uh, firewall configurations through- the Pick out the trash. Unit. Right, right. Feed the all that dog. Stuff. What's that? I, mean, I, I take out the trash, feed the dog. You may have a number of things on well, that. Well, yeah, no, that doesn't show up in Google Classroom. Um, so if you're looking for something besides what Google Classroom provides on its own, I use Google Keep. Uh, mm. I like Google Keep because I can have Google Keep kind of in the margin of all the other Googly stuff that I use throughout the day. Uh, you know, if I'm in Google Docs, I can look at Google Keep. If I'm in Google Classroom, I can open up the little uh, nine dot menu next to my profile picture and get into my Google Keep and I can see my to-do list in Google Keep that way. Uh, so I'm a big fan of, the, of Google Keep for that reason. Uh, That's cool. I, I actually use Google Sheets, right? So, and, and, and for me, you know, it's just sort of like, you know, date posted, Data I accomplish it, accomplish it uh, description and maybe comments, right? And and in and, and, and it ain't gorgeous, but on the other hand, I can search my to do list very easily, and it's not like some company is going to come and go, which is kind of nice. I, I will add this about to do. One of the things that we should always have on our to do list is make sure we catch the questions in the chat. Richard's done a real good job of that. Day. But I noticed that when we were talking about podcasts and you were mentioning Anchor FM, I was mentioning Soundtrap, John asked the very good question of how much access do these things give you for free? With Soundtrap, uh, there, there, is, there is a pretty tight limit uh, now on, on what you can, not what you can do, but how much you can make and, and use, which is fair, right? You want to be able to really try out the tool before you decide whether to spend any money on it. With Anchor, is there any cost to uh, doing what you do? The only cost is you have to put up with Anchor saying this podcast is hosted by Anchor. But you know, that, other than that, no. I'd, I'd say that's a good trade-off. Yeah. Uh, and I'll give a shout out since you're talking about, about Soundtrap to a kind, a, a kind of a competitor to it, Twisted Wave. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Twistedwave.com, which I think I learned about from you many years ago, Rustin. I, I remember mentioning to, that uh, to you at some point, but but they, they've kind of they've come along, right? Like they they've done some cool things over time yeah. as well. So that that's that's quite cool. Speaking of cool things, this cool podcast that would be a webinar uh, is 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 nearing the end of its time, unfortunately. So I you know we 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 will have questions for next week, no doubt. All right. Mm -hmm. um, so, so real quick, you know, what we do uh, in, in, as teachers getting together, sharing ideas, having some fun sharing ideas is we're caring for ourselves because that puts us in the very best uh, uh, position to be able to reach those kids who need something creative at a time when they need it. Uh, a reminder that if you have never signed up for my newsletter, I hope that's something you will consider doing because not only does it give you a lot of good info, uh, you actually have the opportunity, here we go, and the link is, bam, right there. You have the opportunity to win a, a $5 Starbucks card and do it. We, we do a little drawing and, and get that going. And, and that, that's quite good fun. Um, I actually just put out uh, the, the November newsletter. And let me get that in the chat as well. Boom. All right, and this is what it looks like. You're gonna find uh, shout outs to cool people like Richard who, who mentioned X or Y or Z to us. Uh, and, and there's like, we've been, we've been celebrating the good work that innovative nonprofits do. And so World Bicycle Relief is, is, uh, is this amazingly cool thing. Give that a look. Here's what you're getting today. That was like a little bit of that, it'll come down. Jetpack, Jetpack, need I say more, Jetpack, right? And there's all kinds of other good, uh, other good videos you might wanna watch. Who doesn't want to visit that place? 
So, so feel free to, to give that a look as you go as well. Uh, as I mentioned, nextvista.org, it's a library of videos by and for teachers and students everywhere, free to use, free to contribute to, free to download from, all for a student audience, all screen content, my own little attempt to save the universe from ignorance, one creative video at a time. I have a blog at Rushton, R-U-S-H-T-O-N-H dot com. That'll be in the links that I send to all of you who registered. Uh, and there are books, I wrote books about getting better as a teacher, making your school a great place for everybody, and even working as a leader uh, with technology in, in, in cool and interesting ways. Richard. Well, so if you go to my website, or one of my websites, practicaledtech.com, I have my weekly newsletter. It comes out on Sunday evening with my tip of the week. And if you sign up for my newsletter, you get a copy of the Practical Ed Tech Handbook a 64 page PDF of my favorite tips, tools, strategies for using educational tools in your classroom, whether that classroom is hybrid, virtual or in person. All right, all right. And there is this as well. Oh yeah, my YouTube channel hit 31,000 people watching me make screencasts. Wow, uh, so including the latest one, which is how to record a video in PowerPoint uh, using a built-in tool that's kind of cool in PowerPoint. And also how to automatically subtitle and translate your PowerPoint presentations. Very cool. You can find me on Twitter, uh, at rmburn. I've been there since the dawn of Twitter. And also you can send me an email, richard at burn.media. Absolutely. All right. So our next show Thanks, is next John. week. Sorry, what? I John said thank you, and I said thank you to John. And the John, John, John is, is is good people for that. That's for sure. Yeah. Matter of fact, there were some there were some nice notes in the chat here uh, about uh, my November newsletter as well. So Judith mentioned that uh, the lo she loved the manatees video about about that guy and and his his story. Like so, he's he's like this eleven year old, and he and he's he encounters this boat that's going out to like do manatee research and they let him on and, 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 he, and he's like completely transformed. Now he's been you know, 20 years later and he's like head of manatee research in his country and in, in, in Central America. I mean, it's just this amazingly cool story. Uh, let's see, we had Mary mention this as well. Thank you much, very much for all we got going. Maggie mentioned the, Maggie mentioned the jetpack video to a friend who runs in Philmont Scout Ranch. Oh, very cool. I was Eagle Scout back in the day. Thank you very much. All right. And lots of other thank yous. You guys, thank you so much for joining us. We hope that you get something good out of these different things we do and that you will keep sending us questions. Although if you take a break for a week, we'll still have plenty. <laughs> kind of way that works. Um, but we hope to see you next week. And uh, we thank you as always for joining us. So with that, we will say, see you next week. <laughs>